Hello everyone, and welcome to your first energy lab. So up to this point, we have been uh, approaching energy without really using a lot of numbers. Sure, we've had pieces of pi, and we've had boxes of energy in our LOL diagrams, right? but we haven't really calculated an amount of ability to produce change for any of our storage mechanisms. So this is where we're going to start now building those storage mechanisms so that we can make this whole thing more mathematical and more predictive. And we're going to start out with figuring out the math model to elastic potential energy. Okay? And in particular, we're going to look at the elastic potential energy stored in a stretched or compressed ideal spring. What makes it ideal? Something we'll talk about in the post lab. Okay? Suffice it to say that the ones you're going to use will be ideal. Now, before we can actually build the elastic potential energy stored in a stretched or compressed ideal spring, we first need to understand how springs work. And now, of course, in order to store some elastic potential energy, you have to first stretch or compress a spring. And it has no ability to produce change if it's just sitting there. Right? You have to stretch it or compress it. Now, why does it then have the ability to produce change when you stretch it or compress it? Because if you've ever played with a spring before, you know that it then applies a force. Right? It exerts a force. We're going to call this the force exerted by a spring. And notice we're going to use the symbol capital F, as we always do for force, and a little subscript of S for spring. This is different than tension. Okay, tension is usually reserved for things like strings and wires and, um, and ropes. All right, spring force it is different. I know a lot of times people tend to confuse the two, but spring force is special. Why is it special? Because it has its own special pattern that we're going to learn about in this lab. Now, we could either use, dis either use a stretched or compressed springs. Um, all of the springs that I have to use are stretch springs or that you're going to actually use for you guys in your uh, Pivot Interactives is uh, going to be a stretch spring. And there is a fancy name we have for that. We call that elongation. We denote it by a lowercase x. Now, you've seen an x before, right? We've used x for horizontal position. And I think the reason that they tend to use X here is because when you elongate or stretch, compress, sorry, a spring, you are changing the position of the end of the spring, right? By stretching it out or compressing it, you're changing the position of the end of the spring, hence an X, plus E is already something else, right? So X for elongation, F sub S for the force exerted by a spring. Now we do need to be a little bit careful here in how we define elongation, okay? This is often a little confusion here. So you're gonna use a program in this one called Pivot Interactives. Okay? And in your Pivot Interactive, uh, it's going to use a spring that kind of looks like this, right? A nice horizontal spring, okay? And you'll see it there kind of just sitting there. And then it gets attached to a dial spring scale. Okay, we've used spring scales before. We used uh, vertical spring scales in the force of gravity lab. Right? This one's got a dial on it, all right? and it's round like this, and it's attached to the end of the spring. And as you play the video, it's going to stretch the spring, or if you will, elongate the spring. Right? And you can read the force that's being exerted right off the spring scale face, right, right off the dial face. So it's pretty straightforward as far as using uh, the Pivot Interactive for it. Okay. Now, in order to measure the elongation, right, you're going to turn on the uh, little ruler that you can use inside of Pivot. And once you turn on the ruler, right, then you can measure the elongation when it reads a certain amount of force on the spring scale. And I believe I have it set up uh, so that you're doing, you know, one Newton, two Newtons, three Newtons, four Newtons, five Newtons, and six Newtons of force. So at each one of those, right, you're going to stop the video. You're going to use the little ruler thing to measure the elongation. But what is the elongation? Now, notice this spring is neither elongated nor compressed. So the elongation here is zero, which means you can't measure the length of the spring, right? and record that as the elongation. 
right? Because here's an elongation of zero, but it still has a length. So instead, you need to measure how much it stretches or compress. In other words, you would need to use your ruler to measure something like that. Maybe put your ruler on the right edge of it, right? And then when you stretch it out, you would read it on the ruler to see how much it stretched. Now, the ruler is a centimeter ruler. I need you to convert to meters, okay? I need it in meters because I want the slope to be in a certain form, and right? so we need meters, basically, mainly because newtons are also in meters, okay? Kilogram meter per second squared, after all. So I want this to be in meters as well, so convert that over, please. And so make sure when you're measuring the elongation, you're only measuring how much it stretches, not the overall length of the spring. Not that you couldn't do the lab that way, right? You could measure how long the spring is when it's neither stretched nor compressed. You could then measure how long the spring is when it's elongated and subtract, right, and figure this out. But in pivot interactives, probably just as easy for you to measure this straight out. And there are some instructions in the Pivot Interactive that you will be opening up and using, right, to help you set it all up right, and even a little example thing that I'll have you do so that you can check with a multiple choice question whether you are um, using the program correctly. So here's the purpose of the lab you're going to do, to create graphical and mathematical representations of the relationship between the force exerted by an ideal spring and its elongation. And like I said, you're going to use pivot interactives to take your data, and then you're going to use our old friend graphical analysis to graph the results, and then you can finish up the rest of your lab sheet. Now, I do want to make one thing clear that's going to, it's a little weird, a little different, okay? Um, if we're doing the lab this way, where you are stretching the spring until the spring scale reads a certain amount of force, right? then what you are controlling is the force exerted by the spring. Right? You are controlling when the force is reading one newton, two newtons, three newtons, and so on. So that makes this the independent variable and elongation the dependent variable. However, when it comes time to make a graph in graphical analysis, as you will see on your lab sheet, I want you to graph it the other way around. I want you to make graphs of the force exerted by a spring versus the elongation. I want you to put elongation on the horizontal axis and the force exerted by a spring on the vertical axis. Why? Because I want the slope to have a certain meaning. Okay? We could do the lab the other way. right? We could stretch the spring a certain distance and then use the spring scale to measure uh, what the force is. It, but I don't think the spring scale is easy to, uh, easy to estimate with because of the way the, the hash marks go. So I find it easier to do it the other way, right? Um, and this also comes closer to matching what, your, what uh, the in-class students are going to be doing. Okay, so again, when you get there, and you'll see it on your lab sheet, it's very specific about it wants force exerted by a spring on the vertical axis and elongation on the horizontal. Right. Should work pretty well, of course, being a, uh, a pivot interactive. They always work well. So hopefully that works for you. And then you will finish the rest of your lab sheet and you will learn something about ideal springs.